Last uh, Sunday, we, I did a special Thanksgiving uh, message, so I kind of went away from what we were currently doing. So I'm going to go back to that. You know, Sunday mornings, uh, we go through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, and uh, New Testament, Old Testament, back and forth. And we're currently going through the uh, Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. So if you have a Bible, would you join me in 2 Samuel chapter 4? And we have ushers coming down the aisles right now because I'm going to cover two chapters. And if you don't have a Bible or a mobile device, get their attention and they will get you a Bible. And you can either keep it or borrow it. They even mark the place for you. And you can keep the Bible and the marker, <laughs> the bookmark if you want. Uh, we want you to be blessed by God and follow along with me. You know, the Old Testament, uh, often there's a lot of narrative you know, stories, and, and so uh, I try to cover uh, a lot of ground in the Old Testament and uh, on Sunday mornings, and so we're going to do two chapters today, and I promise to get you out of here uh, on time, okay? <laughs> so chapters four and five of Second Samuel today. Where do you guys get your character influence from? I hope it's not just Facebook memes. We could, we could be in a lot of trouble if that's where it's all coming from. Maybe you get some of your character influence from books that you read or, or friends or your parents. Um, I think all those might help to build good character depending upon where they get their <laughs> influence from. You know, what's their worldview, right? But the Bible is unique in that it's the authority of God, the authority from God. And you know, one of the main things that he uses it for is to instruct us in how we're supposed to live. That's not the only thing, I don't think, but it's a big part of it, to instruct us in how we're supposed to live. You know, the Apostle Paul talked to uh, young pastor Timothy about this because he was a preacher and he uh, was leading a church and he was raising up other people to do that. And he talked to him um, about the, the importance of God's word to people um, on several occasions. As a matter of fact, I wanted to share one with you this morning. It's from 2 Timothy chapter 3 where Paul said to Timothy, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's so awesome to hear that. And it's true. You know, in other words, I think what we should glean from that is that any time that we read it or study it, we ought to be taking away something that sets us apart, even if we don't know it. <laughs> you know, something that helps me in my journey to be complete in the Lord, that he wants to equip you and me for every good work. Thoroughly equip us, instructing us uh, in righteousness. And I say all that because sometimes people read the Old Testament and they can't really see that that's the case. But it is the case, all scripture. And th these chapters we're going to look at here today are no different. As a matter of fact, I called this a study in building godly character. That's what I titled this, building godly character. Because what we're going to see is King David, that his success, if you want to call it success, or greatness, it says in, in, in one of the, the verses here, is because the Lord is guiding his life. And he's yielding to that. And people prosper when God guides their life and they, they yield it. And so I want to take uh, these two chapters and have kind of a main theme of each one and focus on that. So in chapter 4, um, David's being prepared for being the king of Israel. And uh, what I want us to take away from this, at least I did, was that we need to learn to wait. And so we're going to see from David's example in chapter 4 to what I call learn to wait, okay? And then we get to chapter five, uh, it's gonna shift uh, as, um, you know, he's a believer, obviously, and, and most of you are believers, and so as a, in the life of a believer, in chapter five, we're gonna learn to walk. So it's a little bit different. Learn to wait, learn 
to walk, regardless of what happens. You know, David's going to experience bad news, good news, opposition, and yet through it all, God is building godly character in his life. And that's what he wants to do in your life and my life. So uh, with that said, here in chapter 4, as we begin in verse 1, we want to learn to wait. So let's see the example of David and apply it to ourselves. And here's what the writer said. When Saul's son heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost heart, and all Israel was troubled. Okay, I want to do a little background uh, commentary before we move on. The book of 2 Samuel is primarily about the life and ministry of King David. Most of the events surrounding uh, the 40 years that he was reigning as king over uh, Israel. I called it the triumphs and troubles because that's what it really is. You see all through this book, there's triumphs and there's troubles. Just like in, in, in your life as, as a Christian, you know, I know that you, you and David are different, obviously, in what you're called to do, but we have triumphs and troubles, and, and so therefore there's a lot of parallels that we can glean um, from his life. Now, all that said, it doesn't start out that great for him. For one thing, he is given a divided kingdom. David is embraced as the king over Judah, the southern tribe of Israel, but the northern tribe went with uh, Saul's son Ishbosheth. And uh, so that whole northern area was uh, under, under his control. <clears throat> King Saul, who was David's predecessor, even though he's dead, we learned that in chapter 1, his influence lives on in his family and, and you know, like his crew that was uh, with him and, and so forth. But what we've been seeing in the last few chapters is that those people have been dying off. Because we were told back in chapter 3 that Saul was going to be weakened and David was going to be strengthened. And that's the pattern that we see going on uh, right now. Like it says there with Abner. You know, Abner in verse 1, he was Saul's general, and Joab, David's general, killed him back in chapter 3. Now, David didn't want Joab to do it, but Joab did it, did it anyone, anyway. Uh, and because all these guys, it's fallen apart on them. And so now... Saul's son, it's Ishbosheth, that's who it's talking about there. We're told that he has lost heart. And he's losing heart because it's all, it's cratering, right? The rebellion against God, the, the northern tribes are troubled because it's not going well here for their leadership. So that's the background of what's happening. So as we um, talk about this this kind of theme of chapter 4 of learning to wait. Let's uh, look at David's example as we go through the events that are surrounding this transition of, uh, of the kingdom. It says, Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of troops. Verse 2. The name of one was Baana, and the name of the other was Rechab, the sons of Rimon the Beerothite of the children of Benjamin. For Beeroth was also... Uh, part of Benjamin because the Beerothites fled to Gitaim and have been sojourners until this day. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel and his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. <laughs> Okay, so that, that boy there is Saul's grandson. And um, I believe that, you know, it, it, it seems out of place, this little verse that's there. And I believe it's there to let us know that next to uh, Ishbosheth, who's currently king over the northern tribes, next to him, this is the only other heir to, to Saul, right? and the ma remaining male heir to the throne uh, of Saul, and we see that now he's crippled. What happened was, uh, in the ancient world, when a king would 
take over from another king, often what they would do is they would kill anybody who they thought could be in opposition in the future to the new throne, right? And everybody <laughs> thinks that that's who David is, right? So then there's, there's all this trouble. And they're hearing that people are dying, even though David isn't the one who's driving all this uh, to happen. And so here, the nurse who had l that little boy, Ishbosheth, five years old, she hears that it's starting to crumble and she goes running off with them. You know, Jonathan and Saul are dead. Oh no, they're going to come after Mephibosheth. So she goes running off and he falls and now he's crippled. And as we're, we read there, I believe that Ishbosheth's two captains are thinking the same thing. That they're, that they're in trouble, so they need to, you know, it's like when anybody doesn't have godly influence, the first thing that they do when things start to go bad is they go to self-preservation. I mean, that's who I was. I, mean, weren't you, I was like that when, before I knew the Lord. Like, when things go bad, you're like, okay, what do I got to do to make this okay so I don't get in trouble or whatever? And, and that's what these guys are doing. It's all about self uh, preservation because they don't have uh, a godly influence. Well, let's see what happens. It says in verse 5, then the sons, and I'm not going to say their names again, um, set out and came to about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who was lying on his bed at noon. He must be a teenager. He's sleeping all day there. And, he, and they came there all the way into the house as though to get wheat and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab <laughs> and Baana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he was lying on his bed in his bedroom, and then they struck him and killed him, beheaded him, and took his head, and were all night escaping through the plain, carrying a head. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron, and said to the king, Here's the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy who sought your life, and the Lord has avenged my Lord the king this day of Saul and his descendants. Wow. It's pretty violent, isn't it? They think that David's going to be happy about this. You know, maybe they're thinking, maybe David will give us a place on his leadership team if we, you know, because remember, they're all about self-preservation. What can we do to get ahead kind of a thing? But here's the big thing that they don't understand, and nobody seems to at this point. Saul was not David's enemy. He never considered him his enemy. Now, Saul considered David his enemy, right? But David didn't think like that, even when Saul was trying to kill him. And so, it's not the Lord that's having these guys running around killing each other off. It's just sinners doing what sinners do. But they think that they're helping David out, right, in this action that they're taking here. So they run all night. They got Ishbosheth's head, and they show up to David. Check it out. We got his head. Here's your enemy. Well, what does David do? How does he react? Verse 9. But David answered, I'm not going to say their names again, and said to them, As the Lord lives who has redeemed my life from all adversity. You might want to circle that. When someone told me, look, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good news, I arrested him and had him executed in Ziklag, the one who thought I would give him a reward for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous person in his own house on his bed Therefore, shall I not now require his blood at your hand and remove you from the earth? So David commanded his young men, and they executed them, cut off their hands and feet, and hanged them by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner in Hebron. Put yourself here where they are, right? You're standing there. We're all witnessing this. And, and picture these guys as David responds. You know, because again, they're thinking they're going to get a reward or something. I'm going to be chief over something. And then he starts to respond and their chins are like, oh no. 
This is bad. It's like in chapter 1, and David even re, um, refers to that. Remember that guy who claimed to kill uh, King Saul? He came running and told David that, thinking that David was going to be all jazzed about it, and David wasn't all jazzed about it, and had him put to death. And so now these guys uh, lose their life too. It's all really kind of a bummer that this is here. But I wanted um, to emphasize here something about David that's so important. And that's that he's learned an important lesson. And that is that he is committing his life to the Lord. And when, when he is committing his life to the Lord, he resists taking things into his own hands. And so that's why I called this learn to wait in chapter four. He's, he's learning to wait. You know, and as you, my friend, commit your way to the Lord, um, even through adversity like David's faced, you will learn to wait. It's so important for believers to be like professional waiters, <laughs> you know, and no matter what's going on, what's the Lord doing? Learn to wait. Okay, but someone might read this and go, well, then how come David hasn't put to death instantly? He didn't wait on that, you know? Well, there's a simple answer to that, I think, and that's that um, David is the king, and so not only is he a believer, but he's also responsible for governing Israel, too. You see, and uh, the, the, the king over Israel had the responsibility at times to carry out judgment, and he had to do it to keep the order there. Now, some people say that's what the church is supposed to do today, that we have that responsibility. But the church is not the government. That's not what we're here for. God called the church to go and make disciples. You know, even though the church, uh, uh, even though sometimes God calls individuals to be agents for change in the government, that's not our primary role. Our primary role is to make disciples. You know, it's like we can make new laws. We can, you know, establish things that it really protect the citizens and so forth. And that's awesome. And I hope we do. But that doesn't change hearts. <laughs> and so people think that we're supposed to like judge people so that they will get in line. And that's not what the scriptures tell Christians to do. As a matter of fact, we just studied it when we went through the book of James. And James said, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so we got to be careful about that. I'm called to be an agent of grace and help people to discover God's grace and have a, get a new heart like God gave me a new heart. But David has a different role. And let's remember that as we go through the Old Testament that the king of Israel had a different responsibility than you and I do. And so as king, I think the main reason he hasn't put to death is to distance the nation from evil. You know, it's as if he's saying, look, they may think I support this, but I don't support what they're doing, and neither should any of you. But again, the application here, watching David respond to Saul and Abner and Ishbosheth and all the rest of them, is to learn to wait on the Lord. Because remember, God made David many, he made David king many years before. And so David knew that would happen. And so he is in a, in a, in a big hurry to get Saul and the rest of the people out of the picture. So he just patiently waited, even though there was all this turmoil uh, going on. It's been like preparation time for him. Just like you, my friend, are going through preparation. You're being prepared for what God's going to do in your life in the future. And so it's important that we let the Lord work in our life and on our life so that he can move in whatever way he wants to when that comes up. What I'm trying to say is this. David knew that God would bring about his promises, and so he wanted to wait on that. And he wrote about this a lot in the Psalms. As a matter of fact, I wanted to show you one example from Psalm 37, verse 9. And, and uh, we can look at this one together. It's up on the screens. He said, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Isn't that great? 
David knew we had to wait. He had to trust the Lord. You know, that psalm, if you get a chance for a little homework assignment, maybe go read Psalm 37 on your own today because in that same one, he says things like, you know, don't fret, you guys. It only causes harm, but instead just rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him to work. It's, 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 it's uh, uh, needful in our life. And the reason David can wait is because he knows something about God. And you know what that is? He knows that God is faithful. God's faithful. The Lord's always been good to him. And so now he can make it a, his life habit to wait on the Lord. And so can you. <laughs> so can you. So that's chapter four. Chapter four. A key way that God builds character is that we will learn to wait, even if things, are hard things, are going on. Okay, now as we move into chapter five, um, the, the, we, we shift a little bit here to learn to walk. Learn to walk. And let's begin uh, reading here in verses one through five. And here's what the writer said. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are b your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years years. Okay, this is great. <laughs> um, the whole nation is finally starting to get it. <laughs> There's been division before, opposition, but this is a big day in the history of Israel because they're anointing David king. Now, God had already used Samuel like 15 years before to anoint him uh, as king, but like most things, you know, people are a little slow getting on God's bus sometimes, aren't we? You know, it's like sometimes it takes us a long time to catch up with God's plans and purposes. And so we'll just stand there looking in the bus, <laughs> but not really get on, right? Well, they finally are, and it's great. Did you notice there in verse 2 that it said that um, he was calling him to shepherd over his people? Did you guys see that? Isn't that like a sweet little phrase. You know, that's God's heart, is that people would be uh, shepherded. The same thing is said about Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, when it's talking about the, uh, it's a, a, a prophecy of the coming Messiah, and it says that he would shepherd his people, Israel, and, and it's the heart of God that there would be servant leaders over his flock. And what I mean is men and women with, with a heart like God to lead people like he would lead them. A servant's heart, you know, not harsh with them, not demanding, not bossy, but to love them and care for them and teach them, feed them like little lambs, you know. Sheep, God's people, are hungry. You know, I heard, um, I think it was James McDonald say one time, if you feed the church a really good meal one week, they're going to come back the next week just as hungry as they were the week before. <laughs> so we're hungry for the word. It's, it's, it's the words of life to us. And, and so the, the shepherds need to be teaching people the word. And I think that that's the thing that I get the most thanks for here as being a pastor teacher is just to, to try and faithfully, the best I can in my ability to faithfully teach you the Bible, you know? And to me, it, it, it makes a huge difference for Christians to get this in their life. And then, you know, to, you would do that on your own too. And, and, um, and so God wants people with a servant's heart and, 
And that's one way, you know. So all the Israelites are in agreement now, and, and uh, they've given David full authority now. Even though he had the authority from God before, now the people are on board. And I think it's in First uh, Chronicles where they had a three-day party here when this happened. Because and, and, it's a big deal, you know. And you know what that reminds me of? And then I'll move on. Um, one day, the Bible promises that Jesus is going to return to earth. As sure as he was here the first time, he's coming again. And he's coming soon. You know, the last thing in the Bible is, come quickly, Lord Jesus. He's coming soon. And we're stoked for that, at least I am. And when he comes, there's going to be peace on earth. And we're going to be unified. And there's going to be a big party. And it's going to be awesome. And I'm really looking forward to that. And this kind of prefigures that a little bit. You know, David in some ways is a type of Christ in the Old Testament and, and, and he's a type of Jesus and, and Jesus will come and he will unify. He's going to come uh, to, his, to Jerusalem and uh, set up his kingdom, his reign on earth. And we're looking forward uh, to that. Okay, well here's what the first thing is that David does once he's king. Let's look at verses 6 through 8 together. It says, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, you shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking, David can't come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Okay, here's what's happening. David wants to make Jerusalem the capital city. It's uh, right there in the center of, the, the, of Israel and in Judah. And he, it's been Hebron, but he wants to have it to be in uh, Jerusalem. So the first thing he does when he's crowned king officially is take it, <laughs> right? Go to take it. Except the Jebusites are there, and they've been there a long time. You know, twice in the Old Testament, in Joshua and Judges, the Hebrews tried to drive the Jebusites out of Jerusalem, but they couldn't. So now the Jebusites are all arrogant about it. And that's why they say there, we'll just guard it with our, our, our blind people and our crippled people. They're, you're not going to take this from us because there's been a pattern. And they've had it forever, right? Um, and there's a reason why um, they think that because of the geography of the land. And we're going to show you a picture here of uh, that area right around. Up in the right-hand corner, you can see the old city wall of Jerusalem. Well, this valley, I think that one's the Kidron Valley, but they, the valleys, these deep valleys run around the city. And so, um, you know, in the ancient world, you would, you would build your, 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 how, your, your cities elevated so you could defend them easier. Right? Because you'd have an advantage looking down as opposed to the person coming up. Right, It's easier to f shoot stuff down, throw stuff down, or whatever. And so they had success defending uh, uh, that city. And so they're taunting David now with that. That's what's happening in what we just read. So don't mistake what's happening here. Um, when David responds like this, don't think that he, it means he hates handicapped people. People read this and that's what they think it means. And to prove that he doesn't hate handicapped people, when we get to chapter 9, he gives Saul's crippled son, remember Mephibosheth? He gives him like a high place in his kingdom. So it's not that. It's that he hates their attitude. You know, they're, they're taunting him with something, so, so David's coming back at him with something. It's like, you know, guys do this. You know, some guy teases one guy, and he's like, and the other guy responds like, oh, yeah? Well, your mama, or whatever. You know, like that kind of a thing. So guys do that, and, and it's just he hates their attitude. What are you doing, crippled and lame? All right, so I want to, for the rest of our time, we have a little time left here. I wanted to take you through some application stuff here in chapter 
5. Because remember, we, we, we went through learning to wait in chapter 4. Now here in chapter 5, I want to uh, give you some specifics in this idea of building, uh, you know, that godly influence in your life and learning to walk through it. We're going to look at some things that David did, as actually seven of them. I'm going to go through them quickly here so that you can, you know, maybe take a few of these with you, jot them down, or just remember them so that uh, you can apply uh, these to your own life. And here's the first one that we get in what we just read. And the first thing that he does that we can spiritually apply is he gives up, uh, he takes territory, right? And um, we ought to desire to give up territory of our life to God because God wants all the territory of your life that you will give him. Jerusalem was a strategic place that had to be won by David to go forward. So he goes after that first. And in the same way, there may be an area of your life that God wants to win in order for you to move forward. Sometimes Christians stay stunted in their growth because they won't let the Lord have a key area of their life. They want to hold on to it because maybe it's, they think it's, it's weird how we like some of our old stuff, we, we think it's comfortable to stay in that when it's really bad for us. And so maybe there's a particular area of sin in your life that God wants to take and you need to give that territory to him to move on. Or, you know, you have great doubts in your life. Maybe it was influence you got as a young person and now you doubt things. Or, or you have great fears. You know, some people are frozen in their life as a Christian because they're fearful. But I think in learning to walk, we are urged by the Lord throughout, especially in the New Testament, to, that, that he could have it all. <laughs> That's what it means to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ, that he is taking over more and more and more of your life all the time. I mean, think about this. The Jebusites had control of that place for a long time. And God gave David the ability to quickly remove them like that. And it's a picture, I think, of how even long-term bad habits can be removed if we will let God do it. Because his power is greater no matter how much the Jebusites are dug into your life. He can remove them if you let him. Okay, here's the next one. Look at verse 9 and 10. It says, Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the Milo and, and inward. So David went on and became great. <laughs> and the Lord God of hosts was with him. The city of David, it's called. Even to this day, you know that? If you ever get a chance to go to Israel, uh, it's everywhere when you're there. And I, I have a couple pictures to show you. Um, uh, of, so that little uh, instrument there, that kind of that ancient stringed instrument is everywhere. That's David's, you know, it's, a sim it's like his symbol, the symbol of the city of David. And the next photo even says the city of David uh, everywhere. There's, there's statues of him and so forth. I mean, right there, you guys, is a is a lasting image of a blessing from God. Because he's just a guy who the Lord blessed. But remember, it says there, what's happened? David went on and became great, and the Lord of God of hosts was with him. David didn't do what he wanted and ask God to bless that. What he did was humbly just follow the Lord's leading. And so our number two in our list of seven that we're going through here for application in, in that learning to walk is to walk humbly. <clears throat> you see, I believe that um, building godly character re requires humility from us. And, you know, David is an example of walking humbly before the Lord. As a matter of fact, the prophet Micah said that one of the things that's essential for our, uh, our following the Lord is that we would walk humbly with him. Um, and so David gives us that example. Um, you know, if, if I am, if the Lord and I are, are doing this, I am not acting in humility. 
But you see, David is, is joined with his God in sweet fellowship because I think partially his humility is just, okay, Lord, I'm going to do what you say, yielding to him. Let's look up at the next one, verses 11 and 12. It says, Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David in cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. You see, he's just getting blessed upon blessed upon blessed. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. I would like you to notice there at the end of verse 12 the purpose of his ministry. He's the king of Israel, but he has that, that's his ministry. Just like you and I have a ministry, and we're, we have different ones. But notice that I believe it's the same purpose for all of us. The, the purpose that you see there at the end of verse 12 is for the sake of the people. And so that's why I have here number three, the benefit of others. When God um, lifts someone up, it's for the purpose of the benefit of others. You know, all you have to do is read through uh, the first, first Corinthians section on the gifts of the Spirit to know that we are given supernatural gifts from God for the profit of all. I'm not supposed to hoard things to myself. <laughs> My life doesn't belong to me anymore, and yours doesn't belong to you either. It belongs to Jesus, and he can do, you should let him do whatever he wants to do with it. So if I have a supernatural gift or ability, then that really belongs to the Lord, and I should share it with other people because it's for the profit uh, of all. And so, you know, it's like sometimes we can forget that we are blessed to be a blessing to others and not just hang on to it our, ourselves. And you know, I'm not great at this, but there's one thing I try to remember, at least recently, when it comes to this subject, and that's this. I try to keep in mind that God loves people. And I think that that's, when that's your default, then you'll be more free with your ministry that you have. You see, God loves people, and because God loves people, he wants to do something for his church, because it's people. And he also wants to reach the lost around here, because it's people. When something good happens here, I believe it's for the sake of building up the Christians, so we will reach out to others with the same grace and mercy that he gives us. And you know why? Because God loves people. <laughs> he really does. And if you're here today, and you've heard different than this, I want to correct that thinking because God doesn't hate people. God loves people. And maybe you're here today and somebody invited you because you're staying with them for Thanksgiving and, and, and you've got a problem with God. Or you think he has a problem with you. Or, or you, you're like I was in my 20s and you've made a disaster of your life. And you don't want to know what to do now. You're sick of it. Or, or you've, you know God is good and you've been running from it because you're pursuing something you shouldn't be after. If, if you're falling in any of those categories, I just would like you to know one thing. And that's that um, God loves you. He really does. And he goes to great lengths to show that he loves you. He sent his only son his only son, whom he loves very, very much, to die on a miserable cross to take your sins upon him. And that you would believe and trust in that one who wants to forgive you of everything that you've ever done. Anything that you've done to offend God is forgivable, except for rejecting it. And I'm just telling you, my friend, God shows this all the time to people. And I'm here as a messenger of his to let you know that he loves you and wants you in his family, but it requires faith <laughs> and to receive that gift from his son, Jesus. And, and we're gonna pray for you in a few minutes. And I just pray that if that's you, you would even in this moment say, you know what? I believe that's true. And I want that for myself. 
and you would receive Christ for yourself. Just remember, it's for the sake of his people. It's for the sake of his people, the benefit of others. Okay, David, here's a downfall of David's life. We can learn from this one too. Number four, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he had come from Hebron. Also more sons and daughters were born to David. Now these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Okay, can I get a volunteer to read all these names for me? There's 11 of them here. I'm not going to try them. I'll slaughter them. I know I'll get Nathan and Solomon. The rest of them, I'm not so sure. Um, you know, I will say this. The, the line of Jesus comes through Solomon. Solomon will be the next king of Israel after David. And then uh, Jesus, our Lord, uh, will come through that uh, royal line. So, um, but I wanted to point out here, and I've brought this up a couple times in previous weeks because this whole multiplying wives thing <laughs> keeps coming up, so I figured the Lord wants me to talk about it again. And just know that this was against God's will. It was, especially for the king of Israel. It was in the law. Moses warned them that multiplying wives could turn their heart away from God. And you know what? Later it does turn David's heart away from God for a period. Because it was a weakness of his. Women was a weakness uh, of his. And we have to know that we do have weaknesses. So number four in application for learning to walk is discipline yourself. <laughs> discipline yourself. You see, it's really important that you and I um, take part in this whole character development. And you, my friend, just like me, we need to take part in protecting our character. And so we need to discipline ourselves. David, in this area, doesn't discipline himself. Other areas, he does. But this was important, and it causes big problems uh, in his life. And some people read the Old Testament, they'll say, well, God doesn't judge him for it. So, you know, it's like immediately there's no judgment, so he must endorse it. And then people start to think that that's the way it is today. You know, like in some churches today, or denominations who, who support things like uh, gay ministers. You know, there's, there's denominations that think that it's good to have gay and lesbian clergy, right? We see this a lot. And I've, 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 I've read the commentary from those people who are doing that enough to know that this is the response when you say, you know, you're critical of it. They'll say, well, but look how God is blessing me. I'm not being judged by God for it. So it's, they're like saying it's proof that God approves of that. Well, my response would be, but what does Scripture say about that? You see, because that's what David's response should have been. I mean, he knew Deuteronomy. He knew the law. And it's right there. Don't multiply your wives, especially if you're a king. <laughs> All you have to do is go back to the truth. And the same is true in our culture today. A lot of times, we just don't want to hear it. Or we, our, our feelings are a different way. And so we will for, we'll just, well, I'm not going to read what it says about that sin over there. And I'm just going to do what I want to do because it feels like it's okay to me. But what is the truth? You know, the truth says both of these things I'm talking about right now are sins before God. And you go, well, how come God doesn't judge it right then? Well, because God is long-suffering. He's merciful. And I believe that the Lord gives us time to repent. You know, maybe you're doing something right now you shouldn't be doing and you know it. Well, he gives you time to repent because he's gracious. He wants you to turn to him of your own accord. And he wanted David to, to turn away from those things. But he doesn't, and it messes up his family life a lot, you know. And I pray for those who are in unrepentant sin today in the church. We do things that we know we're not supposed to be doing and then hope that, you know, we think that God approves of it because he's not doing anything about it right now. That is bad theology. Okay, so now here comes the opposition. <laughs> here comes the opposition. Let's look at verses um, 
17 through 19. It says, Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? Sorry, I lost my place here. This is awkward, isn't it? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. <laughs> Anytime there's progress for God's kingdom, the enemy fights against it. I mean, haven't you guys experienced this in your own life when you'll have like victory in something? And then it's like, you know, say that you, you're a married person and you've decided, you know what? I am going to live for Jesus by the way I treat my spouse. I'm not going to use harsh words anymore. I'm just, and you even say it out loud, you know, and, and that's what you've decided. Or maybe you're a, a business person and you're like, you know what? From this point forward, I am going to handle all of my business affairs above reproach, right? Or you're, you're a single person and you, you're deciding, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything before the Lord in purity of heart and, you know, be careful about sexual sin and those those kind of things. And, you know, if that's you or things like that, you can be sure that some kind of trouble is going to come along to try and mess you up. Because that's what the Philistines do. <laughs> you know? The enemy is just really good at this stuff. He's smart. So here come the Philistines. But notice what David does. Did you see that? He doesn't just act first. He asks first. So number five here in learning to walk is make sure to ask God first. <laughs> make sure to ask him first. Did you see what he did? He's like, should I go there? You know, and if I go, will you go, you know, <laughs> you, you, will you help me? You know, that kind of a thing. And it's great the way that he, it's just so simple. And the Lord responds, you bet. You know, you got nothing to worry about. I'm with you because you sought me first in this. It's really good. Uh, thing to see. So make sure you ask God first before you make decisions about things. Verse 20, it says, so, Lord, so David went to Baal Perazim and David defeated them there and he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim and they left their images there and David and his men carried them away. Okay, so number six <laughs> he uh, gives uh, God the credit. Number six, he gives God the credit. So you see what happened here? He trusted God for something enough to ask him for it, and then God did it, and so he gave him glory. Right? And this is a great thing. God you know, does something awesome for you, and the first thing we should do is not say, I am so awesome. <laughs> we should say, God, you are awesome. You know, thank you uh, for doing that. It's good for us. He doesn't need me to give him glory, but I need it. I need to give him glory, and so do you. So make sure um, you give God the credit. Did you notice that the Philistines left their idols there in the battle when they ran off? You know, that's what they would do. They would take their, their little statues, their little gods with them into, into battle. And now that they're losing, they go running off and, and, and David's crew can go destroy him now. Uh, by the way, this should be a clue to you that your God is not real if you have to give it a ride somewhere. <laughs> right? You know, please take me with you. <laughs> you know, like a little statue. It's so weird. Isn't it amazing what people will worship? And, you know, people today will say, well, those, those ancient people, they were just Neanderthals. We're so sophisticated now. We don't do that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah? I just saw a god in somebody's yard yesterday, <laughs> right here in town, you know? And they're all over the place. But it doesn't have to be a little statue. It can be a lot of things are gods to people. It could be a person. It could be something you own. It could be something you do. Everybody's got a god. 
The thing that I love about David is that his God is the Lord God who created all things, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he goes to that God, and then when that God does something for him, he gives him credit, glorifies him, and that's a really healthy person who does those things. Well, there's one more. Look at verse 22 with me. It says, Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up. Circle around behind them and come up upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. <laughs> Boy, the enemy does not give up easily, does it? Here they come again. But notice, notice he asks God again. So that's number seven. It's our last one here. And, um, and I, I call this one, remember to ask him every time. Remember to ask him every time. Because here's what happens. I've been a Christian long enough to know that this is what we do. We think that everything runs in patterns, right? It's like, I've got this Christian thing wired. So when A happens, I just do B and C will come of that, right? Every single time. So I don't even need to pray, you know? Except that's not how God rolls. <laughs> he doesn't lead people by a formula, but by his spirit. You see, notice here, it's really important. Look back with me one more time. The Lord changed what he told David to do this time. And it's because David sought a fresh word from the Lord. And this is why it's so important to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because the way that God wants you to respond to something one time may not be the same in a similar situation later on. And you know why? Because God wants to build a relationship with you. It's more important than the situation. No matter how difficult the situation is, the relationship that you are building with God is really, really important to him. It should be important um, to you. But sometimes people don't understand that. They don't believe that God's really in this with them. And so, you know, it's like Adam Clark. He was a Bible teacher from a long time ago. He said that the reason people don't ask for supernatural direction is because they don't expect to get it. That's a relationship problem with God. <laughs> Let's not be like that. How about you? Do you expect, when you seek the Lord, do you expect to get direction from him? You should. Because he said if you will... If you will seek him, you will find him. I love how David doesn't say, you know, here's what I'm going to do, God, now bless it. <laughs> he says, what do you want me to do this time, Lord? That is really a wise person. Well, we're going to finish here uh, with our time in the word, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up for one more song. And as they do, let's read verse 25, and I'll make a few comments, and then we'll, we'll close with a song. It says, and David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. I want to say Gezer because I'm getting to be kind of a geezer, you know, but I think it's Gezer is the way you pronounce that. So it works out for David because uh, he listened to God, right? And he did what God told him to do. And, and you know, you will prosper if that's just a simple pattern of your life. I'm going to listen to God, I'm going to seek the Lord, and I'm going to do what he tells me to do. And you can see both times that David sought him, he was, God was faithful. And God's always faithful. You can trust him in that. Well, let's do a little quick review, and then we'll sing. When it comes to building godly character, we've been urged a few things here. Remember, we learned to wait. We've got to We've got to wait on the Lord and not just react. <laughs> and then also we want to learn to, to walk. And we saw some, some things there in our, in our walk as a believer. Like, you know, when God wants some territory of your life, no matter how much you, you're holding on to it with white knuckles, <laughs> that you would let him have it. Let him take it. Uh, that we would walk humbly before him as he blesses our life. And as he blesses our life, re recognize that it's for the benefit of other people, the profit of all. 
that you would discipline yourself and so he wouldn't fall into some of the things like we see happen to David in his family life later on. That you would give God the glory when he helps you with things. And last but not least, make sure you ask first. And ask every time. So that when it's the Philistines coming or the Jebusites or, you know, Ishbosheth or whoever it is, <laughs> that you will be ready for that and God will help you. Will you guys stand with me? And we will uh, sing this song and then I'll come back up and pray and we'll be dismissed, okay?